Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we're thankful. We are glad, Lord, that Jesus has come and our cup overruns. We thank you, Lord, that your cup was full and you drank of that bitter cup so that we might rejoice and know the, have the joy of sins forgiven in our own lives. Thank you now, Lord, for all you've done for us. Help us as we study tonight and bless your word to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Okay, so if everybody has the notes for today, we're going to be looking at the happy sanguine, the most effervescent, outgoing, happiest temperament of all of the four. On the first page that you have there is just a kind of a background. The sanguine is that which responds to the positive and enjoyable in life. And he certainly does. Far more than the other three temperaments do, he responds, the sanguine responds to every impression that comes his way. And whether it's positive or negative, he, re he responds to them. But the, po the, uh, pos the positive ones in particular, that's the sanguine trait. Now, the response is on an emotional level. In a strongly sanguine person, feelings are predominant. See that line there? That's under B there. Remember, all of the, uh, all of the uh, temperaments that we have are blends. Remember, that's what temperament meant, the right blending. They're all blends of different temperaments. So when we, so when we say a person is sanguine, that's his predominant temperament. Okay? And so um, the strongly sanguine person, that's the, the person who's sa who has that sanguine temperament, his feelings, and he goes by feelings, his feelings... Uh, are the dominant thing in his life. And he's uneasy, he's restless, and every impression that comes into his, into his head, he has a tendency to respond to. That is why a sanguine is like a person running in three or four different directions all at the same time. You know what, the, you know what reminds me of a sanguine? Did you ever see in the summertime a butterfly and he's got a bunch of flowers there, and a butterfly he goes from one flower to the other. Did you ever see that butterfly do that? I swear, a butterfly must be sanguine. He goes from one to the other to the other. That's what a sanguine does in, with things in his life. He goes from one to another to another to another. Each new impression is something that um, uh, he can really relate to, and he'll hold on to that till something new comes along, and then... Off he goes in another direction. He's a big child emotionally. He's an easy talker, fresh, lively speech. The sanguine is occupied with the present, and he's very changeable. We went all through all of that last time as we had our overview of the sanguine. Now let's look at, uh, just real quick, because we did a lot of these last week, the strengths of a sanguine. He lives in the present, and this is a good trait because... He faces reality. The melancholic, you remember, we, we looked at the melancholic a little bit last week. The melancholic doesn't live in the present. But melancholic dwells in the past or he dwells in the future. But the melancholic is looking for perfection and consequently he doesn't find it in the present. The sanguine, on the other hand, the present is the place to be. Here's where it's, everything's happening. And so um, he lives in the present. That's a good trait that the sanguine has. He easily enters into the lives of other people's, their feelings, thoughts, and interests. And so he can be tender and he can be uh, sympathetic. But you might want to write in there until the next impression crosses his mind and then it's off to the next thing. You know, the, the sanguine can weep with those that weep, he can mourn with those that mourn, and he can show genuine concern for that person, but when he's, by the time he's out the door, uh, it's evaporated and he's on to the next thing, and he's got his mind set on something else that he has to do, and, 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 those, and then it, it's, it's gone, it's on, it's on to the next thing. Now that doesn't mean that he's a hypocrite, that doesn't mean that he doesn't care, he does. His feelings are real, they're genuine, but they just change real fast, okay? 
He has a potential for a rich life. Sanguines usually wind up as a salesman or an idea man or a preacher. Sanguine preacher will draw a crowd and, and, and attract crowds. And that he's, got, he's got a lot going for him. We're going to get a little into that a little later going uh, in the uh, lesson. The weaknesses of a sanguine, on the other hand, he's flighty and unreliable. He's superficial. He doesn't think deeply. Because he's shallow and everything is on the surface and he takes things at face value, he can be very childlike. And that, in a way, is a good trait. Jesus said, except you become as little children, you shall no eyes enter into the kingdom of heaven. He takes things at face value. He doesn't analyze a situation. He doesn't think deep beyond that next hurdle or that next hill and see what is going to be the outcome. This is the now generation. And so if it feels good, do it. If it looks good, grab it and so forth. And so, and so it's everything is right now without a lot of deep thought going into it. He's talkative. He's given to overstatements and to exaggeration. Sanguine loves to tell stories, and sometimes um, he doesn't feel that you should sacrifice a good story at the expense of truth. Uh, so he has to embellish it a little bit. He gravitates to the enjoyable rather than to the necessary. The things that are necessary are not necessarily what the sanguine is seeing. He's seeing more of the excitement of what he wants to do and or maybe what he is doing uh, so the necessity is lacking there he overemphasizes the emotional with a corresponding lack of willpower the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak i believe was written for the sanguine he has a desire to do that which was right do that which is good do that which is proper but they are basically weak-willed and are easy now that's when I say weak-willed, that doesn't mean that, uh, that that's an evil thing. It's just that he, 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 he's not committed to a goal like the cleric is, and he's on to, to the next thing, from uh, one, one thing after another. He just lacks that willpower to say no. Actually, he's got a lot of willpower. What he needs is won't power. <laughs> okay, so then he lacks the ability to concentrate. He's restless. His activity may be without purpose, just doing something to be doing something. So these are all the weaknesses here of the sanguine. The choleric will also be active and busy all the time, but not like the sanguine. The choleric has a goal in mind, and he's working towards that goal. Don't get in his way. He'll run right over you to reach his goal. The sanguine would never do that. He'll change his goal. He, oh, this, you want to do this? Okay, let's do this. And, and off we go over this way. The needs of a sanguine person is he has to be the center of things. He's not happy unless he's at the center of, of things. His ideas, and he has a lot of them, but his ideas are the result of inspiration and not deep thinking. It, he's filled with inspiration. He's one thing after another. He speaks off the top of, of his head. He doesn't study and research that much, but he, so therefore he needs help in bringing some of these inspirational ideas to fruitation. Remember Peter, and by the way, we're going to look at Peter tonight. Peter is the classic sanguine in the Bible. He really is. He is the classic sanguine. He, they threw the mold away with, with Peter. I mean, Peter is such a uh, was such a sanguine. We see him so many times. He opens his mouth before his brain is in gear, and he says things because that's the impression. He gets these impressions. He doesn't, didn't think, uh, think things through, and so right away, he's, uh, he, 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 his mouth is going before he's thinking what he says. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up into, to the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah appear. Jesus is transformed, transfigured before them in all of his Shekinah glory. Peter and James and John see it. They are privileged to have this marvelous revelation take place right before their eyes. Peter has to open his mouth and say, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's build three tabernacles. And God has to speak from heaven and tell him to shut up. 
he just runs off at the, at the mouth. Well, that's, that's a sanguine trait. Remember when Jesus was walking on water? Peter's in the boat. He sees the Lord. What does he do? He's over the side of that boat, and he says, Lord, bid me to come. Jesus says, come on. Off he goes across the top of that water, never thinking of the consequences till he was a good way from the boat. And then he got thinking about it, and uh, that's when he started to, to sink. And so his actions are impulsive rather than deliberate. Rather than deliberate. If you live with a sanguine, or you know a sanguine, or work with a sanguine, don't feel that he's your enemy. He's not. He may hurt you. He may slight you. He may do things that you don't like, but there's no animosity behind it. He's just from one impression to the next, and if you've got slighted in the process, that's, uh, that's just an accident. He will be helped by being given assignments that make him develop habits of self-control and follow through. And finally there, don't expect him to be what he cannot. He may need a detail man to pick up the pieces. And I wrote in there, behind there, to pick up the pieces, or in some cases to pick up the wreckage. Because sometimes inadvertently the sanguine will leave a trail of wreckage behind him. He will unintentionally cause more hurt feelings than any other temperament. It'll be unintentional. He doesn't mean it, but that's what will happen. So the sanguine with his warm, buoyant, and lively temperament is receptive to almost all things that, that come his way. Every impression has easy access into him, and he's, he's thrilled with each thing that comes along. His feelings control him. Now, in the case of the melancholic, his mind is affected. In the case of the cleric, his will is affected. But in the case of the sanguine, it's his feelings that are affected. Let's do it, okay, let's go, without thinking it through. He's active and he's restless. He's without a purpose, or at least a continuing purpose. He may have a purpose, but that purpose might change three or four times in the course of a day. So he's got pur purpose and he's, he's open to it, but uh, it could change. He's open to many, many impressions, um, but these impressions don't necessarily cause him to think or to act, simply to enjoy. He enjoys life. He enjoys people. He enjoys meeting people and doing things with people. His feelings will change quickly. He's, he's a big kid. He thinks aloud, but the words will flow without his brain being in gear many, many times. And we have Peter as that classic example of that. Did you know that when Peter, Jesus told, um, Jesus told the disciples, he said, uh, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and, and uh, there they're going to crucify me. Peter was the first one to say, not so, Lord. And then he said, Peter, you're going to deny me before the cock crows three times. You're going to deny me. Peter said, not me. He said, these, the rest of them, they might deny you. I'll never deny you. Within two hours, he had denied the Lord three times. There's the sanguine temperament there. It was very, very changeable. His experiences. The sanguine always has something happening to him, and he's going to tell you about it. You know what I saw? Well, I, was I was driving down the road the other day and such and such a thing happened. I was in a shopping mall and could you believe what happened? He's always got an experience to relate and he tells about it. The sanguine is undisciplined. For the most part, he does not play by the rules. He's not governed by rules. You know, my wife used to work at Southfield Christian School for many years. She was a secretary there. And there was a teacher in the school, very good teacher. The kids loved her. But she was as close to being a pure sanguine as you can get. She did not play by any of the rules. She marched to a different drummer all the time. And 
they had a system there. I guess it's similar to a system we have and a lot of other churches have. They had some church vehicles. And if somebody needed a vehicle, they had to go and sign it out. You know. Well, she decided to take her class on a field trip. But this idea of checking out a vehicle, signing it out, asking for it in advance, never once crossed her mind. And they had a large group that was going out someplace that day. <laughs> At least they thought they were. <laughs> she got a vehicle first. I don't know how she got a key, but she took her class on a field trip. Uh, uh, there was the devil to pay over that. I mean, she just marched to a different drummer. Now, here's the thing. Here's the point. Uh, the reason we're saying this. When they dealt with her about this situation, she honestly could not see that she had done anything wrong. She saw that there was a need. She had a need of that vehicle. Well, I need that vehicle. There is the vehicle. So what? it just made perfect logical sense to her to go and get that vehicle. Didn't matter procedure or if anybody else had spoken for it or anything like that. That's the way a sanguine mind operates many times. Well, I've got a need for it. I need to do that. And so uh, just go ahead and do it. Nothing lasts very long with a sanguine. And you know what? That includes anger. That includes anger. If you get a melancholic mad at you, it'll be a long time before they ever forgive you. If you get a cleric mad at you, you'll never be forgiven, chances are. <laughs> but if you get a sanguine mad at you, don't, don't sweat it. In <laughs> just a short time, you'll be over it, and everything will be back to normal. Like the butterfly, from flower to flower to flower, just a, a happy-go-lucky. When you meet up with a sanguine, you know what? You go away with the impression he's your best friend. He's your absolute best friend. Well, he just falls all over you, and, and why you think, well, this guy, uh, he just thinks the world of me. He's made such a fuss over me. You go away, you're feeling so good. Boy, you know what? By the time that sanguine's around the corner, He's pretty much forgotten all that. And if he sees somebody up ahead and not somebody else that he knows, it's the same thing all over again. And he's that way in love affairs as well. And that's not good. That's not good. He'll push aside every other thought. Love at first sight? Sanguine's invented that one. Oh, I just met this girl. I just met this guy. There's no one like him or her. This is it. This is the real thing. Unfortunately, it doesn't last too long. There used to be a popular song, a little novelty song years ago. It was called, If I'm Not Near the Girl I Love, I Love the Girl I'm Near. I think a sanguine wrote that song, because <laughs> that's, that's the truth. He's infatuated, but he's quickly over with. Now, God said, when Moses asked him his name, he said, I am. I am. That speaks of an eternal present. The Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah that God inhabits eternity. And when he said, I am, that meant that there's no past, there's no future. It's an eternal present. That's what eternity is going to be like. Well, the sanguine is, is kind of, ex in a very limited way, experiences eternity because he's always in the present. He's not building for the future, nor is he grieving over the past. But he's living in the nasty now and now and loving every minute of it. So he doesn't care about the sweet by and by. The causes, Sanguine will get interested in causes. It might be save the whales, or it might be to um, um, stamp out communism. It, may, it could be a number of different causes. And he'll get caught up in them, and, and you'll know it when he does. Because you know what? He's going to try to recruit you. Because it's, he believes in it so strongly that um, he wants you to be in it with him. The only problem is he'll find another cause that's more important and he'll be off and running in that direction. Those, uh, the old interests, they just evaporate and he's got a better cause now. A workshop of a sanguine is filled with unfinished projects that he has started and he hasn't, um, he hasn't uh, finish, uh, finished them up. The sanguine's memory. Well, 
he, re, he forgets names. Do you have a problem with names? That's a, that's a sanguine trait. He forgets names. He forgets promises. He forgets obligations. But he can remember trivia like you wouldn't believe. He can tell you how many times a hummingbird's wings beat in a minute and stuff like that that you'll never use in your lifetime is senseless, needless stuff, but he can't remember the more important things. The sanguine when it comes to religion, it's an emotional religion. The sanguine loves to go to the revival meetings and he loves to get caught up in the singing and in the worship, the praising of God and all of that business. He'll enter right into it and he'll do it without ever being saved. Hey, just join right in, join the crowd. And here's the tragic thing about a sanguine spiritually. It's very, very hard for a sanguine to really be saved because all these impressions that come into his life are, evaporate so quickly. This includes the claims of Christ. And for a sanguine to truly and genuinely get saved, he's at home hanging around the church, hanging around with Christians. But to truly get saved, it's a hard thing for him because he really has to come to grips with God and um, consider the claims of Christ upon his life. Well, the sanguine at home and in his daily life, it's hard. It's hard for him because his purposes, his intentions are good. He goes to church and he gets caught up with enthusiasm. He's going to go out and win the world for Christ. He's going to do all kinds of great deeds for God. He's going to uh, go to the mission field or, or whatever, do this. Uh, he's yielding his life to the Lord. But come Monday morning, he's got a real problem. He doesn't have the self-discipline to get into the Word of God. He doesn't have the self-discipline to spend time in prayer. He doesn't have the self-discipline to really meet temptation on biblical grounds. And what he is at the altar on Sunday, he's in the alley on Monday. <laughs> Someone said he went to the altar, but the altar didn't alter him. And he went to the rites of the church, but the rites didn't write him. <laughs> he's... He's un, unaffected by it in, in the long run. And I'm sure you've heard the story of the sanguine, the, or the, I'm sorry, the, the parents that had the two boys. One was a sanguine, and one was, an optim, uh, one was a um, melancholic. So the melancholic is very pessimistic. The sanguine is very optimistic. The sanguine sees all the good things in everything. His life is filled with expectancy and joy, and he just can't wait for the next thing to happen. His brother, the melancholic, the pessimist, he's just exactly the opposite. Gloom and doom. He goes through life and uh, it, things are just not right. Uh, it's just not right for him. So the parents decide, well, Christmas is coming and we're going to, we're going to try to correct these situations. So they take the uh, they go out and they buy for the little melancholic boy. They buy him all kinds of presents. They buy him everything under the sun so that he'll know that he's loved. He comes down on Christmas morning and, oh, he's just for the first time so happy. Here's all these heaps of presents and they, it's all got his name on it. For the sanguine, they, they want a, just the opposite effect. And so he had his stocking hang, hung up by the fireplace and so they, they go out in the barn they get some horse manure and they fill the stocking with horse manure. The sanguine comes down on Christmas morning and he runs over there and he looks at his stocking and he lets out a whoop and he's filled with joy and he's, whoa, mom, dad, look what I got for Christmas. And they said, what? And he says, a horse. <laughs> and they said, a horse? He says, yeah, I haven't found it yet, but I know I'm getting one. <laughs> well, that's the mind of the sanguine as opposed to the melancholic. All right, let's go to that sanguine temperament page here now. And just we're just going to look at a, um, a couple things here and then get into the scriptures with this. The characteristics of the sanguine, we've gone through all of that. Let's look at the sanguine in scripture. If you take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, 
Jesus gave a parable there called the parable of the sower. And in this parable, the seed, which is the word of God, falls on four different kinds of soil. Now, if you take a close look at those four different kinds of soil, which is really the hearts of these four people, you find that you have the four basic temperaments of man. Matthew chapter 13, and the, uh, the first parable we want to look at is uh, in verses 5 and 6. Here's the sanguine. It says, some, that's the seed, which is the word of God, fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. You might want to underline, not much earth. And then it goes on to say, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. You might want to underline that. Not much earth, no deepness of earth. And then in verse 6, and when the sun was up, they were scorched because they had, and you can underline this, no root. And because they had no root, Jesus said, they withered away. Now he gave the interpretation of that in verse 20 and 21. Look what he said. But he that received the seed in stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and at once with joy, here's the sanguine, the happy temperament, with joy, he receives it. He receives the word of God. He never heard anything so wonderful before, and he receives it immediately. Verse 21 says, Yet hath he not root in himself, he endureth for a while. Not long, just a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Picture told by the Savior of the sanguine. And there's four, four types of soil here, and each one parallels one of these four temperaments. Now turn with me, if you will, please, to the Gospel of Luke, the ninth chapter. Luke chapter 9. And in Luke chapter 9, beginning at verse 57, we have some folks here that may well have been sanguine. In verse 57 we read, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. I'm going to follow you, Lord. I'm going to go with you. I'm going to be your disciple. Jesus said, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. You want to follow me? Where are you going to sleep tonight? You're not going to be in a nice bed. You, not, the foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but I don't have any place to lay my head. You follow me, you're going to be with me. What are you going to eat tomorrow morning for breakfast? See, you got, he doesn't think it through. And the claims of discipleship have not entered into this person's life. And he's just off the top of He said, I'll follow you. Let's look at the next one. Verse uh, 59. And he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. The man's father wasn't dead yet. He was still alive. The man is saying here, I'll follow you, but first I got, I'm going to take care of dad. You don't have to wait for him to, to die, and, and then I'll follow you. Jesus said, Let the dead bury the dead. You come and follow me now. And the next one here, verse 61, another said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go and bid them farewell, which are at home in my house. Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now Jesus was not rejecting these people. He was merely forcing them not to follow him, but to forcing them to make the decision to follow him. They had to make that decision, not off the top of their heads, but to uh, make that make that decision and uh, then follow through on it. So, uh, so we see the sanguine in Scripture. We see his strengths and his weaknesses, which we, we have gone through. And let's look down at number five there, the sanguine spiritually. He can join in easily without being saved. He is easily touched by the love of God, by the suffering of Christ, by preaching on hell. His life can be filled with violent weeping and wild joy. You know, I have seen people just come forward and weep and carry on and, and just unbelievable. Just weep and, oh, just out of control. 
I've seen people get, it reach the heights of joy and, and, and so forth. But you know what? I've observed over the years the real genuine converts, I mean the best converts, I'm not saying the others aren't converts, but the best converts, the most solid people, are usually the ones that maybe they'll just come quietly or maybe not even come at all, just wait to the end of a service and want to talk to somebody. Um, all of that emotion sometimes, many times, is just nothing more than surface. We, it impresses people, but it's not necessarily genuine. It may be just the sanguine doing his thing. When in trouble, the sanguine is zealous for God. When troubles are over, he returns to his old life. The 21st chapter of John, Peter, the sanguine, he goes back to fishing. Jesus had told him three years earlier, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And he left his nets, left his boat, and followed Jesus and fished for the souls of men. Now Jesus has been crucified and he's been resurrected and Peter for some reason says, I'm going fishing. And he took six other disciples with him. A sanguine is a leader. He leads people and he can lead them for good or bad. Here was Peter, he goes back to the old life again and six of the disciples are ready to follow him. It's one of the traits. Uh, of a sanguine. A sanguine pastor will attract a crowd. He goes on in his personal magnetism, but if that is all he's got, he's not going to hold the crowd. He has got to give the folks the word of God. The Bible says, feed the flock of God which is among you. Now many of these people that were uh, pastors, the uh, sanguine pastor, they realize this is not really where I belong. And they, they'll go into evangelism. In evangelism, they can go from church to church and they can get a few good messages and preach those same messages and get big crowds and all of that, and, but they don't have to live with those folks. Did you know, this may surprise you, did you know that Billy Graham was a pastor once and he was a failure? He was a lousy pastor. God called him into evangelism. That's, that's the place um, that he has to be. Well, the trait of a sanguine is optimism. And optimism is another name for hope. And Peter, the sanguine, is an apostle of hope. And we've got some verses there you can look up at your leisure. All right, let's look at the classic example here in Scripture. Peter is it. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 Jesus said, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, some Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But he says, Who do you say that I am? And look at there. Who's the first one to open his mouth? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Just a few verses later, Peter takes him and begins to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. He had just in a matter of minutes confessed Jesus to be Messiah and God. And now, in a matter of minutes, he's rebuking him. That's how fast the sanguine can change. In Matthew chapter 17, we already alluded to that. They took, uh, uh, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to the mountain there. Uh, Moses and Elijah appear. He's transfigured before them. Look at verse 4. Then answered Peter. Now wait a minute. What do you mean answered Peter? Nobody had asked him anything. You don't have to with a sanguine. They'll answer without being asked. Peter just did this all on his own. This was an impression that came passing through his mind and he grabbed a hold of it and started to run with it. It's good for us to be here. Let's build three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And God the Father spoke from heaven. God the Father spoke from heaven three times during the earthly ministry of Jesus. And this was the one time when he, one of the times when he did. And he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, hear ye him. He's saying that to Peter. God the Father spoke to Peter. He says, hear ye him. In other words, Peter, close your mouth and listen to my son. It's good advice. In Matthew chapter 26, Peter said, though all men will be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus says, before the cock crows three times, you'll deny me. It was two hours later 
And Peter had already denied him three times. In Luke chapter 22, we have him saying, Lord, I'm ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And that's when Jesus tells him, no, you're going to deny me, Peter. In John chapter 20, I like this one. This is on resurrection morning. And Mary has been to the tomb. She saw the empty tomb. She doesn't know what to make of it. Peter and John are coming along. Now follow this story. It's a great one. In verse 2, she says, They've taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they've laid him. Peter, therefore, went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulcher. Verse 4 says, They ran both together. Peter and John, they're in a foot race. They're heading from wherever they were to the sepulcher, the grave of the Lord Jesus. They want to see this phenomenon that Mary had told them about, that the tomb was empty. They ran together. Now, we know from other scriptures that John was a young man, probably not more than 20, maybe even a teenager. He could have been. We also know from scripture that Peter was, at this point, a middle-aged man. Now, any 20-year-old ought to be able to outrun a middle-aged man, right? Well, they're running together. The other disciple, that's John, did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. Next week, we're going to see that John is the classic melancholic. Now, he's going to show you some melancholic tendencies here. He gets to the sepulcher first. And what does he do? He, stooping down and looks in, he sees the linen clothes lying, and, yet, and it says in verse 5, Yet went he not in. Verse 6 says, Then cometh Simon Peter following him. There's no stopping, there's no turning with this guy. I don't think he even broke stride. He had to duck his head to get down because it was a low ceiling, and he goes right on into the sepulcher. He leaves John standing outside. John had been there first. John's looking in. Peter, he's not going to stand there and look in. John is the cautious, melancholic here. Peter is the, is the sanguine who isn't thinking through or anything. He didn't know what was in that, uh, that sepulcher. Right on through that doorway and into, and into the sepulcher. Just like a bull in a china shop. Well, he was a sanguine. It's characteristic of him. Uh, on the next page, John chapter 21. This is where Peter says, I I'm going fishing. He takes six other disciples with him. And look at verse 7 there. Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved said unto Peter, It's the Lord. They see Jesus on the shore. They're out in the boat. Jesus is on the shore. He's got breakfast cooking for them. It says, now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, and this is so typical of a sanguine, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and cast himself into the sea. He couldn't wait for him to turn that boat around and, and row it back to shore. <laughs> Man, I can't wait for that. Over the side he goes. He's going to get there first because he wanted to see the Lord. Not a lot of thought went into that action. Okay? Now, when he gets to shore, Jesus begins to sift him. He begins to deal with him. And he says, Simon Peter, do you, you love me? And he does this three times, and Peter says, Lord, you know that I love thee. And the, in verse 17, it says, Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Well, he had denied the Lord three times. Jesus is giving him the opportunity to confess him three times. And it was at this point that Jesus tells Peter what kind of a death he's going to die. Did you know it? That's in the scripture. It's in John chapter 21. He tells Peter he's going to die by crucifixion. It says that his, his, his uh, hands are going to be stretched out and he's going to be carried about. And he tells him this is going to happen in your old age. And it says, this he spake unto him, signifying what kind of a death he should die. Now what would you do if somebody has, if God had just said to you, now I want to tell you about your death. This, this, is what, this is what you're going to experience when you die. What, what would your reaction be? You know what Peter's reaction was? Pure sanguine. His buddy was John. John is standing there. And in verse 21 there, Peter 
seeing him, saith to Jesus, and Lord, what shall this man do? What about John? How's he going to die? What a reaction. He's, Jesus is telling Peter how he's going to die, and he wants to know, how's John's, how is John going to die? That's, that's pure, unadulterated sanguine. Well, we have a, a next page there, which is pretty much we've gone over that. Then we come to the, to the cartoon page here, the little, um, little sanguine guy up at the top of the page. The happy sanguine. See how happy he looks. He's as happy as can be. But nobody is the pure temperament. Now underneath him we have the sand flag. That's sanguine with the phlegmatic temperament. Predominantly sanguine, but with the phlegmatic temperament. That's a great blend. That's just a great blend. He's happy and so forth. And the stability of the phlegmatic is there to to give him some, some stability. It's a great, that's a great blend. Then we have down here in this corner, the sand chlor, the sanguine and the cleric. The sanguine is the predominant temperament. The cleric temperament is behind him. That's a great blend because it gives him purpose. It gives him drive, for, drive with a purpose and um, gives him some, some stability there in his life. Over in the other corner here, we have the sand mel, the sanguine and the melancholic. That too could be, in many cases, a good blend because it balances out some of the sanguine exuberance and uh, kind of holds him down, calms him down a little bit. Okay, on the second last page there, um, just quickly, notice there the positive traits carried to extremes become negative traits. Now all of these good things that we associate with the sanguine, and we're going to do this with each temperament, all the good things that we associate with them, taken to the extreme becomes a bad thing. The ability to converse, that's a great ability, that's a, that's a great trait of the sanguine. Taken to the extreme is keep your mouth shut, quit talking for a while. You talk too much. The sanguine can be the storyteller. Taken to the extreme, he's repetitious. You hear the stories over and over. The sanguine likes to talk about himself. Taken to the extreme, it can be boring and filled with a whole lot of detail. He can be, uh, have an optimistic approach, that's great. But to some people, he's happy and a phony. When I started, and now if you haven't guessed it, I'm pretty much sanguine. But when I started working for Hostess Cake years ago, I had a store down in Detroit, and the customer called in on me. She called the office, and she says, your driver is coming in here, and he's stealing from me. Well, when they hear that, you know, right, you know, right away, that, that's the last thing they want. They said, uh, she talked to the sales manager, and, she, and the sales manager says, what do you mean he's stealing from you? And she says, he's stealing from me every time he comes in here. And the sales manager says, well, how's he doing it? And she says, I don't know. And, the, and so the sales manager says, well, how do you know he's stealing? And she says, he's got to be. She says, he comes in here whistling and singing all the time and so cheerful. She says, I know he's up to something, but I can't catch him. <laughs> so I got called into the office when I got in that night. And the sales manager says, put on a gloomy face when you go in that store from now on. Don't let her know that you're happy. So, all right, um, the, the, the sanguine makes instant friendships, but he'll also frighten others off. And if you're, you happen to be a melancholic, you might get frightened off by that exuberance and that uh, attempt at instant friendship that the sanguine has. It's scary to some people. The sanguine is the life of the party, but to a lot of people, he's this loud and a show-off. The counsel to the sanguine is be sensitive to others' interests and so forth. And in dropping down there, it says learn to listen. A sanguine needs to learn to listen. If you're a sanguine, you'll know what I'm talking about. You need to learn to listen to people. My wife tells me all the time, you're not listening. And I, you, know, you know what happens? First of all, a sanguine doesn't want you to talk. They want to do all the talking. But in those rare moments when they quit talking and let you talk, do you know what they're doing? They're not listening. Their mind 
is racing about what they're going to say next. That's the way it works with the sanguine mentality. So the advice, the counsel to a sanguine is to learn to listen. Discipline and dependability is what you need in your life. The sanguine has to learn to say no to responsibility. Sanguine thinks he can do anything and everything. And he'll try it if you give him the chance to do it. Oh, I can do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You want me to do that? Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll work far into the night. I can do that. That's okay. He, th he thinks he has no limitations at all. They thrive on work as long as you praise them for what they did. And you need to realize, um, I'm sorry, um, I didn't finish there. Um, the last one is try to remember people's names. Did you know the most important thing a person has is their name? It's a precious commodity, your name. Somebody comes up to you and calls you by name. It makes a big, real big impression on you. Your name is precious to you. <laughs> Problem is, is this? Sanguines can't remember names very well. And that's something that a sanguine has to work on. Living with a sanguine, oh boy. I should let my wife teach this part of it. Recognize their difficulty in accomplishing tasks. Realize they like variety. Help them to keep from accepting more than they can do. Don't expect them to remember appointments or to be on time. Praise them for what they accomplish. Allow them flexibility. And remember, they are circumstantial people. Did you know a chameleon has the ability to change colors? If he crawls on something red, he, he, he'll turn red. If he crawls on something green, he can turn green, and so forth. That's an extraordinary trait that God has built into a chameleon. Well, sanguines can, in a sense, be like that. Because whatever circumstance they're in, they can make themselves right at home and right in the center of that circumstance. If you live with a sanguine, realize that they mean well. They are not plotting against you. The sanguine is not your enemy. He is insensitive. He is unthinking. Sometimes he is uncaring, but it's all unintentional. He doesn't mean to do that. And you have to, if you live with one, you've got to cut them a little slack there and uh, realize that that's one of their traits. And be thankful and happy. You've got a happy sanguine to live with. It's a lot better than an old grouch. Now, just real quick, some practical advice to the sanguine. Number one, our faith may falter. God's faithfulness never will. That's good advice for the sanguine. Number two, we will see more and more that we are chosen, not because of our ability, but because of his power that will be demonstrated in our not, get that, not being able. The sanguine usually has all kinds of natural ability. That's not what God is looking for. Jesus said, without me, ye can do nothing. And he has to learn that he the power of God rests in him in what he can't do. He has to turn it over to God to let God do it through him. Number three, you're on the road to success if you realize that failure is only a detour. Sanguines can get down the dumps real quick if things go wrong. Number four, when a train goes through a tunnel and it gets dark, you don't throw away your ticket and jump off. You sit still and trust the engineer. The sanguine needs to learn to do that and to stick with something. Number five, happiness is not dependent on what's happening, but on the relationships that persist in the happening. For instance, if you go to a ball game with a sanguine, or let's say you're a sanguine, you go to a ball game with a friend, what do you really enjoy? Do you enjoy being with that friend, or do you enjoy the ball game? Or maybe we could say, do you enjoy the ball game because you're there with that friend? It makes a difference. Uh, uh, and, and, and so, uh, <laughs> I watched the Tigers last night. Man, that didn't even look like the Tigers. I think it was another team in the Tiger, Tiger uniforms. But uh, to see all that, uh, 15 to 3 or something like that, it, yeah, they won. Uh, that's really great. But the joy of being at the game should be superseded by the joy 
of being there with the person that, that you're with. That's, that's where the real true character is found. When we act on the Word of God and not on our feelings, we experience that God means His promises. The fact is that God watches over His Word to perform it. The sanguine may not keep His promises. He has a hard time doing that. But the sanguine needs to learn God keeps His promises. And everything God says, He does. Slow me down, Lord. I'm going too fast. I can't see my brother when he's going past. I miss a lot of good things day by day. I can't see a blessing when it comes my way. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Good advice for the sanguine. <laughs> Next week we're going to do the melancholics. Um, maybe, maybe you think you're a melancholic. Well, well, we'll find out next week, okay? Let's look to God in prayer. We'll be dismissed. Now our loving Father, thank you for Jesus our Savior. Lord, we thank you for the joy of the Lord, the happiness that comes from knowing Christ as Savior and knowing that our sins are forgiven, the joy of Jesus in our hearts and our lives. And so, Lord, we, as we leave this place tonight, might we go rejoicing, rejoicing because we know you whom to know are right is life eternal. So bless us as we're dismissed, we pray. Bring us back together next time. In Jesus' precious name, amen.